As the lovely Katie mentioned, my name is Andrea Barrett. I'm a culinary nutritionist and a personal trainer, and I specialize in working with people with type 2 diabetes and blood sugar management. My mother has type 2 diabetes, and my grandmother has had type 2 diabetes. So that's what motivated me to become a nutritionist and what motivated me to become uh, interested in, like that's my niche, that's what I specialize in because I, I've seen sort of the ups and downs that they've gone through and I've seen what's worked for them and what hasn't worked for them. And I believe that type 2 diabetes is a lifestyle disease, so it's largely preventable. So there are just some tips, techniques, some supplements, some lifestyle changes we can incorporate into our lives so that we can be happy and have a healthy blood sugar balance. Now this is an interactive presentation, so every now and then I may be inclined to ask you a question. And if you know the answer, I would love to hear it because I do have some prizes. My assistant is Miss uh, Chardet Small over here. Chardet, wave to the nice people. If I hear the correct answer, Chardet will be running around with a prize for you. So we will begin. As I mentioned, I am the daughter of a diabetic and the granddaughter of a diabetic, and I've decided that I will not be next. So people say diabetes, type 2 diabetes is uh, genetic. Uh, mm, that's controversial. It may or may not be genetic. What is uh, hereditary is the way we, we eat. So my mother eats and cooks the way her mother cooks. I may or may not eat and cook the way my mother cooks. So sometimes you'll see a pattern from a grandmother to a daughter to a granddaughter. It may look like it's genetic or hereditary, but sometimes it's just that grandma was using uh, canola oil, mom was using canola oil, maybe all I know is canola oil. So it's just the, your environment. So, and I did mention I'm a nutritionist and a trainer, because studies show that diabetes needs to be attacked from more than one uh, angle. Medication helps, nutrition helps, and also exercise, so it's important to move. Every time we flex the muscle, we exercise, we lift, we do some cardio, particularly doing some weight-bearing exercises, you're burning up more glucose, you're letting more glucose get into your cells. So there's a, a role for on the nutrition side and on the training side. Now this is a chart showing uh, the prevalence of diabetes um, and I, I, basically around the world. I like it when Canada is number one. I really, really like it. I'm cheering us on in the Olympics and the Paralympics. Here we're number three, so we're a little too high for my liking. The lead is uh, USA, followed by Portugal, which I found surprising. Anybody here from Portugal? Okay, and then Canada. So we're in number three. So we need to figure out what strategies we can implement to make, you know, get us further towards the end. We don't want to be the leader. And here is a chart that shows based on our country. So surprisingly, you'll see the areas that are more concentrated in the bright red or in like the dark burgundy have a higher incidence of diabetes. So you can see Ontario, again, we seem to be doing well, Ontario and Canada, we're in the lead. You can see that our friends in uh, BC are doing quite well. They don't have the same uh, incidence that we have here. Now, Here's my first question, so I'm looking for the right answer. I've heard there are three types or four types or five types of diabetes. So has everyone heard of gestational diabetes? Yes, so that, ha that affects pregnant women. And we've heard of type one diabetes? Yep, so that is usually um, your immune system's attacking itself. You do not secrete any insulin. Uh, then there's type two, which is what my mom and grandmother have, and that's what we're talking about. That's largely preventable by lifestyle diseases. Then I've heard of two more subcategories of diabetes. Anybody know? Yes? Pre Which one? Pre-diabetic. Pre um, that is before you have diabetes, but I'll still take that as an answer. This lady will get a prize. Two other types of diabetes. So actually having it, so there's sort of research now that a certain type of diabetes is called diabetes of the brain. Who said Alzheimer's? The gentleman right behind in the hat, Sade, gets a prize uh, in the hat. Uh, so Alzheimer's, I'm hearing, is another type of diabetes. We're calling that type 3 diabetes. Blood sugar of the brain, that's what's affecting it. So that's some of the latest research. Get. No, not that one. There's another type of condition that sort of induces diabetes. Begins with the letter S. There are so, there's a medication that you will take that, if you take it long enough, will cause you to have diabetes. No, not schizophrenia. S, T, someone said it? 
Steroids induced diabetes. A prize for this lady here. So, steroid induced diabetes. So, if you're taking steroids and you take it long enough, you Studies are showing you will develop diabetes. So this is something that's been recognized for about the last 50 years. So what, what they notice is that when you're on steroids, it makes your body produce a lot of cortisol. So you know that uh, here we have our kidneys. On top of our kidneys are the adrenal glands right here. Our adrenal glands shoot out cortisol. So when, you take, when you're on steroid uh, medication, you, it raises your cortisol levels and it puts you in a diabetic state. So, we have gestational, we have type 1, we have type 2, they're now calling Alzheimer's type 3, and steroid-induced diabetes is another form. So, and as I mentioned, so what they do when you have, um, they give you cortico corticosteroids, it's to reduce any really serious or harmful inflammation, and this is what leads to diabetes. So what it does, it, it mimics the action of cortisol, again, produced by your adrenal glands, which are on top of your kidneys, and they are releasing a lot of cortisol, and it's increasing uh, insulin resistance in your body. So diabetes, what basically we want to happen in our body is our blood range to stay, or the glucose to stay between four and eight uh, mmol per liter. So our goal is you always want to keep your blood sugar stable. We don't want these roller coaster peaks and valleys. We want to keep it stable and consistent all the time. So now studies are showing there um, there are benefits of using some herbal supplements. And again, this can be controversial. It depends on what studies you're reading or which practitioners you're talking to. There is no cure for diabetes. There's no uh, naturopathic or allopathic cure for diabetes. However, everything works hand in hand. You can be on medication and use some herbal therapies to help you balance your blood sugar and also do some exercise. So here's a chart that shows uh, the number of people, this is an American chart, that are using complementary and alternative medicine, which are calling uh, herbal products, in the States. So you can see that it's something that you know, men and women and children are taking. The dark blue lines on the chart is for adults, and the lighter blue line on the chart is for children. So on the far left, you can see the number of people using herbal products and, uh, for men and women. And on the far right, these are people using complementary and alternative medicines. So maybe seeing a homeopath or seeing a naturopath or working with a nutritionist. Now, according to the National Institute of Health, 34% of adults use some form of alternative therapy. Is there anybody in this room that uses anything other than medication to balance their blood sugar? I'll raise my hand for my mom uses a few things. So there are, a few, there are a few of us that do. So you can either use it in conjunction with your medication. My mom was taking metformin. My grandmother was taking insulin. Um, or you can use it as a replacement. But again, this is something that you need to speak with your doctor. I'm certainly not advising any of that. But I'm just showing you what the numbers are saying. So people use it with medication or as a replacement. So the main risk that um, some people are the main risk you need to be aware of is that using some natural therapies can cause hypoglycemia. So that's making your blood sugar go very low, which I think means it's working because you're lowering your blood sugar. Uh, there could be a potential adverse reaction with medication. So sometimes um, some things are contraindicated. You want to make sure you're taking, for example, if you take omega-3s, if you're on blood thinners, you cannot take them at the same time because omega-3s naturally thin your blood and help you lower your blood pressure naturally. Also, the un uncertain long-term safety. Now, this is the mechanism. There's basically five different mechanisms when it comes to herbal therapy. So you either want, so the herbs you take can help with glucose production. So they're herbs like berberine or fenugreek. So that just helps you when you're producing your glucose. And then there are herbs that help with the intestine. So this will help how you're absorbing your glucose. And then we have uh, herbs that help with your pancreas. So we know that insulin is secreted, it's like squirted out of your pancreas. Some herbs help your, insul your pancreas uh, release more insulin, like ginseng or bitter melon. And then we have some other herbs that help with peripheral glucose uptake. So the ability for your, uh, your muscles and your cells to uptake some of this, um, the glucose in your blood. So we're talking about ginseng, bitter melon, and cinnamon. So this helps the gluco glucose leave and get into your tissues faster. Has anyone heard of chromium before? 
Yes. So chromium is something that's found in many foods. It's an essential trace mineral. If you have too little chromium in your diet, you can't use their glucose efficiently. So what we're hearing is that our soils are depleted and don't have as many minerals and nutrients as they did you know, back in grandma's day or great grandma's day. So chromium is missing from our soils. It's uh, deficient, so that means we're deficient because we're growing our carrots and our broccoli in these deficient soil. The importance of chromium is that it's required for binding insulin to your cell membranes. So uh, you need to find foods that have a lot of chromium in there or you, you can supplement with chromium. So chromium, as I mentioned, is required for binding your insulin cells to your membranes. And they've done lots of studies that showed if you add it to your diet using the right form uh, and in the right, uh, the right frequency, it can, have a it can have a beneficial effect on your blood sugar levels. There's another supplement called berberine. Um, has anyone heard of berberine before? Yes, great. So this is something you can find with your local practitioner or at your health food store. So this involves the AMPK pathway. So now what this pathway does, it plays a really important role. It's like your master regulator and it helps with your cell cellular energy. So this is something that we need. They've noticed, recent research shows that when you take berberine, it helps um, with your balancing of your blood sugar. So it pay, plays a pivotal role in this mediating of this pathway, the AMPK, and it's also a really great antioxidant and it just helps your body use more energy. So here's um, uh, a schematic of what's happening here. So by, it's almost like a trigger. Berberine is like a trigger to get the AMPK going. When it does, miraculous things happen. You're losing weight, it decreases your body weight, it increases your fatty acids oxidation, it's lowering your cholesterol and triglyceride levels. Most people who have type 2 diabetes also have high cholesterol and high tri triglycerides. Use my mother, for example, type 2 diabetic. She had high blood pressure, she had high cholesterol, and she had high triglycerides. Glycerides. You see the four of them, they're like four sisters. They're, they always hang out together. It also increases your glucose uptake. It decreases your fasting glucose. So, you know, when you take your fasting glucose in the morning, this supplement research shows will help decrease that and also increase your insulin sensi sensitivity. So what we want is for our cells to be sensitive to insulin. So as soon as it's, it feels it, it sees it, it's in the area, it lets it into the cell. So that's berberine. So think of it as a, um, a trigger to activate the AMPK. Uh, and so this slide just says that, it, actually this is really interesting. So like I mentioned, my mom was on metformin, my grandmother was taking insulin. So one of the most impressive studies on berberine was when they took 500 milligrams of this compound two to three times a day for three months, um, it equaled or I wouldn't say replace, but it was equivalent to what metformin was doing. So they found it was able to control, whoops, control blood sugar and lipid metabolism as effectively as metformin. So the researchers described it as a potent oral hypoglycemic agent. So that's something to keep researching and to look out for, berberine. Think of it as that trigger to the AMPK pathway. And then there's alpha lipoic acid. Now, there are three green vegetables that are high in alpha lipoic acid. Um, my prize runner, are you ready with your three prizes? Can anyone give me a green vegetable? Kale is not the right answer. Kale is usually the right answer for everything. Kale is really good. Uh, and there are some really great kale chips upstairs if you haven't found it yet. But no, not kale, but keep eating your kale. Broccoli, yes, broccoli for this lovely lady here. You, you have to put your hand up and say it loud so I can hear you. Brussels sprouts. Did you see my slides? No one ever guesses Brussels sprouts. <laughs> That's right. So, so far, br Brussels sprouts and broccoli, there's one more green vegetable high in alpha lipoic acid. Spinach for this lady over here. Very good. So, Alpha, alpha lipoic acid, high in things like liver, spinach, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, tomatoes, and organ meat. Incidentally, organ meat's really, really high in alpha lipoic acid. Alpha lipoic acid is an antioxidant. So this is something that our body makes, and it's in every single cell in your body. So this is where it helps turn that glucose into energy. So when we have some kale, 
that turns it into energy. When we have a cookie, turns it into energy. When we have anything that has glucose in it, it turns that into energy. So what studies have showed is that alpha lipoic acid has received significant attention as a possible treatment for diabetic peripheral neuropathy. So that's when you get that tingly sort of pins and needle feeling in your hands and your feet. My grandmother had um, some neuropathy in like her fingers. So it would just feel like it was tingling all the time. So studies show that alpha lipoic acid is, is, um, seems to be successful in working with neuropathy. And it's been used in Germany for you know, decades, like for many, many years they've been using this uh, in Germany to help with painful and dangerous complication of neuropathy. Uh, however, what, uh, in the research I found, a lot of the success stories on alpha lipoic acid wasn't necessarily orally, it was uh, by IV. So here's an example of a study where they had 600 milligrams of an IV dose of uh, alpha lipoic acid daily for two weeks in 22 patients. They found that it was beneficial. So the insulin sensitivity was great, great effect on triglycerides and lipids. Uh, HDL went up, LDL went down, but it was intravenous. So ALA is great. It's still controversial in terms of does it have to be intravenous or does it have to, can it be oral? If it's intravenous, it's really, really impractical. Um, and oral, if you take too much alpha lipoic acid, there could be some side effects. So here's just a chart showing you uh, insulin sensitivity. So the lines in blue show you before treatment uh, how your glucose was metabolized, and the lines in yellow show after treatment. So you can see in all 12 cases, there was a tremendous increase in insulin sensitivity after using alpha lipoic acid. Okay, now time for another question. There is another herb, a really great herb, that's known as the sugar destroyer. Who said that? Jim Nemma, how did you know that? You just know, congratulations, you get a prize. That's right, so this is what it looks like. This is a picture of the sugar destroyer, also known as Jim Nemma, which you can find, it was a lady with the sunglasses on her head. She's coming with your prize. You get a prize. So also known as the um, sugar destroyer, uh, an herb that's been around forever, been used for, forever. So what makes this unique is that it contains gymnemic acid, which is really amazing for us because it helps transport glucose into the cells. So that's the whole issue about diabetes. We eat something, we have an apple, we have a piece of cake, we have bread, we're drinking juice. All of the glucose gets in our blood and just gets backed up. It doesn't go anywhere. So these gymnemic acids, which you find in genema, the herb, help transport the glucose into your cells. So it helps escort it and get it into your cells. Um, so this helps maintain normal sugar metabolism. This helps with your pancreas because we know that our, uh, our pancreas is the organ that secretes the insulin. And also, which is a, a great bonus, it helps to neutralize the taste of sugar and cravings. When I was little, I had a thing for junk food, and I could polish off a bag of Mr. Christie soft and chewy cookies. Does anybody remember those cookies? Uh, yeah, I could, yeah, you remember. I could polish off a bag of that by myself, done. Uh, and I liked really sweet things. I liked um, Twizzlers. I liked uh, gob, gob, gob stoppers. I liked jawbreakers. My dad used to say I'm keeping my dentist uh, comfortable in his lifestyle. I would eat all of that stuff. I really, really, really liked sweet things. I used to eat, as, you know, it's almost embarrassing to say this, but back in the day before I was a nutritionist and knew any better, I would love caramel sundaes with peanuts. And I would ask for extra caramel sundae on top. I really, really craved lots of sweet things. Gymnema is something I should have been having back in those days because it neutralizes the taste of sugar and cravings. Fortunately, I'm over that now. I don't need anything sweet like that, sweet enough. All right, the next supplement we're going to talk about is vitamin D. So recent research shows that vitamin D works on different mechanisms. So what they're looking at and what they found is that it actually helps us produce uh, more insulin. So if you have a problem with your pancreas and you're not secreting enough insulin, you're not producing enough insulin for whatever reason, studies are showing that A, we're all deficient in vitamin D, so not even people with diabetes, but just as a population, period, especially if we live in North America, we're deficient in vitamin D. So using vitamin D, they're, 
discovering will help us produce more insulin. But a lot of these studies have, are recently, are mainly just animal studies. So there's um, a study going on, it's in the States, it's the d2dstudy.org. So if you check out their website, you can get more information. So they're doing a study over the next four years, um, giving, uh, you know, a certain population. Uh, they're working with people, um, it's like a clinical test case, to see how much vitamin D they need to have and how it affects their, their blood sugar. So, and this is interesting, according, this is from the Canadian Diabetes Association, which I think is great. It's nice to see an association that's, you know, tied into um, the medical side, you know, being supportive of a supplement. So this says that recent studies have found that a deficiency in vitamin D results in a reduction of insulin secretion. So if you're deficient in vitamin D, you're not secreting enough insulin. And this is what is resulting in hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia, high blood, high blood sugar. So both insulin secretion and sensitivity depends on the intracellular calcium concentration and vitamin D helps regulate that. So I was very pleased to see that this came out from the Canadian Diabetes Association. Because sometimes on the, the natural side, you'll hear things and if they're not, no one really takes them seriously unless they're validated or backed up from someone else. So now we know vitamin D. Is everyone here taking their vitamin D drops? Or taking their vitamin D supplements? Yes, okay, because you know, we're not... Is it talking about vitamin D3 or D2? Vitamin D3. Yeah, so vitamin D2 is plant-based, vitamin D3 is animal-based. But you can get both, you can supplement with both, or you can get both from food. But vitamin D, everybody, vitamin D. Going the wrong way. Okay, time for another question. Do we have another prize? Okay. What is the fourth abundant mineral? But before you answer, let me tell you that the fourth abundant mineral studies show have a great effect on, with people with type 2 diabetes. The fourth most abundant mineral in your body. Magnesium. magnesium. There's a, there's a, we have a doctor in the room. <laughs> magnesium, that's right. Okay, magnesium is found in lots of great foods. Uh, it's found in whole grains, nuts, leafy green vegetables. What kind of leafy green vegetables do you all like to eat? Spinach, Spinach yep, kale. I know that man likes kale, you like kale, yep. You guys like kale chips, or like, do you like to saute your kale? Kale in your smoothies? Saute, okay. She's not ready for kale in her smoothies. Kalaloo is good. Yes, kalaloo is very good. You keep eating your kalaloo, young lady. Um, what other kind of leafy greens do you guys like? Do you like? A spring mix salad. That's good. Very nice. Anybody else? Dandelion, right? Arugula. Uh, all sorts of greens. So lots of leafy greens high in magnesium. There's another reason to put green things in your smoothie. Put spinach in your smoothie. Put arugula in your smoothie. Put kale in your smoothie, put it in your soup, put it in everything. Lots of green leafy vegetables. So magnesium is essential to our body's ability to process glucose. We are all really, really deficient in uh, magnesium. So the more magnesium we have in our diet, the better our body is able to process glucose. So we just talked about some of the, the green leafy things, green leafy vegetables that you can find um, that are higher in magnesium, and also nuts. Uh, we tend to only eat peanuts for some weird reason. Any other kind of nuts that you guys like to eat? Almonds, right here. Walnuts are very good, at high in omega-3, good for your brain. Pecans are good, I like pecans. Pistachios, that's great. So like, jazz it up. We're always eating lots of uh, peanuts, and now we tend to only eat almonds, but there's lots of nuts. Brazil nuts, huh? Cashews are good. I love cashews. Cashews, walnuts, pecans, um, Brazil nuts, uh, mix it up. Lots of different nuts. Um, so magnesium is essential to our body. So the more variety we have in these leafy greens and our nuts and our whole grains, again, we all tend to just eat rice all the time. There's, there's uh, barley, there's buckwheat, there's quinoa, there's teff, there's amaranth. Try to change up your different grains. So studies are showing that a magnesium deficiency has been associated with diabetes. So that can be for two reasons. So that can be either we're consuming way too much calcium because we need a calcium magnesium, they balance each other out. So either we're bombarding our bodies with way too much calcium and we're not, it's, we're, it's outweighing what the magnesium we have in our body or we're not eating enough magnesium. So eat more whole grains, good nuts and lots of leafy greens so you can get more magnesium in your body. A diet rich in magnesium, a study in 2007 found, was associated with a 15% reduced risk of developing type 2 diabetes. So that's 
that's you know key for somebody like me that has a grandmother with diabetes, a mother with diabetes who no longer cooks and eats like they did. But if I get more magnesium in my diet by varying my diet, eating more leafy greens, nuts, and whole grains, perhaps even supplementing with a great magnesium, then I will have a reduced risk of developing type 2 diabetes. There was also a study in 2011 that was a meta-analysis, so it reviewed the results of 13 other studies and showed how much magnesium people got in their diets, either through, um, uh, so it was either people who didn't get enough magnesium and they saw that it, they were at a greater risk of developing diabetes. I don't want this to happen to any of you, so I would like you to eat more green leafy vegetables, uh, vary your nuts, and some whole grains. Magnesium is not a silent killer. <laughs> that should have said diabetes is a silent killer. <laughs> Um, so whenever you find some studies, you find others that contradict everything you've just read. So one uh, piece of research I came across showed that there was no evidence that magnesium helps to manage diabetes. However, research suggests that people with lower magnesium intake may have a greater risk of developing diabetes. Well, that just, like, really, what are you saying? Uh, even though not, there is no clear evidence, you're showing me that when you look at someone with type 2 diabetes and you, you're doing their test results, they have a lower uh, amount of magnesium in their body. To me, that means you need more magnesium. And here's just a, a study that shows uh, the benefits of using chromium on the supplementation for glucose and how it helps with your fat, your, your lipid metabolism, and your glucose metabolism. I have another guess the mineral. So this one is found in lots of foods. It's an essential trace mineral. If you have too little in your diet, your body can't use glucose effectively. We may or may not have discussed this one already. Let's see his hand went up first. Zinc. Which one? Zinc. Zinc. No, not zinc. I did hear it. Chromium. Chromium. Yes, we talked about it already. Who said that? The lady in the back with her hand up. Chromium. Uh, yes, yeah, so before you give her this, I just want to show you this bottle. This prize, you have a really good prize. Uh, so I know if you can see it in the back row. This is coconut vinegar. So vinegar studies are showing because it's um, a, lots of vinegars. Apple cider vinegar, coconut vinegar. Vinegars in general help with maintaining your blood glucose levels. It actually helps lower them. So I'm giving you a very nice bottle of coconut vinegar in the hopes that you go home and make some good salads with some good leafy greens, and I don't mean iceberg lettuce, and you use some of this on your, uh, so you promise to do that? Yes. Uh, promise, promise? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. Put it on everything. Okay, and so here's just another chart showing you, just because I thought this was really interesting about magnesium. So you can see people with type 2, type 1 diabetes on the right, people with type 2 diabetes on the left, and then there's the control in the middle. So adding it to your diet, or your, no, this is showing the magnesium levels in people with type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and the control. So you can see, if you have type 2 diabetes, you're always going to have less magnesium than someone who doesn't have diabetes, or even someone with type 1 diabetes. So it's really important to increase your magnesium intake. And here's just a chart showing you where you can find this great magnesium. So we talked about the, our nuts and our green leafy vegetables, but you can also find it in unsweetened cocoa powder. Anybody ever use unsweetened cocoa powder for making some great desserts, like raw desserts or baking? Holiday season is coming. Uh, unsweetened cocoa powder is high in magnesium. On a completely different note, some research shows that the reason women crave chocolate, anybody here crave chocolate? I've had my craving chocolate moments. It's because we are deficient in magnesium. So it's not that we're craving, craving a chocolate bar, we're craving magnesium. So that's, it, that's where it comes from. Because our body innately is perfect. It knows if we need something. We're seeking out chocolate when really what we need is magnesium. Also flax seeds, does anybody use flax seeds? Yeah, good, how do you use your flax seeds? Where do you put your flax seeds? In your oatmeal, okay, it makes it nice and thick and you're getting more fiber. How do you do? In your smoothie, okay. Is there kale in your smoothie too? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, good. Anybody else use flax seeds? What do you put your flax seeds in? Yes, on your yogurt. Okay, and you had flax seeds? Yeah. What do you put your flax seeds in? Uh, 
Juice, okay, so this just shows you all the great things you can do with flax seeds. Uh, oatmeal, yogurt, uh, juice, smoothies, you can bake with it. It's, uh, if you're vegetarian or vegan, that's how you make your egg with uh, flax seeds or chia seeds. So getting more flax in your diet is great. It makes things nice and thick. It's full of fiber. It'll make you feel full. You're getting some great omegas. You're getting some good fat. Very good. And now we know we're getting some good magnesium. So. It says there's a, de this, a deficiency in magnesium, increases your insulin resistance. Many type two diabetics are chronically deficient. Like when I think of my mom, when we were growing up, my parents are from the Caribbean, my uh, parents were from Jamaica, they immigrated to Canada in the 70s. We didn't grow up eating nuts. We grew up eating, uh, like I would say a cross between Caribbean food and, and Canadian food. I think when you have first generation Canadian children, they tend to want to have Canadian food. So I was fighting for craft dinner all the time. I didn't want to make all that great Caribbean stuff my mom wanted to, you know, share with the family. But we didn't grow up eating a lot of nuts. We ate a lot of callaloo, which this men lady mentioned, which is like the Caribbean cousin to spinach. Um, and like, I would see my grandmother eating lots of green vegetables and she's cooking up okra and she's having, uh, you know, fish and she's steaming up things. But I was still trying to have like a happy meal. We didn't have a lot of nuts and seeds as kids, but now, now that I'm loving it all, I can see the benefit and the reason, because I feel like my grandmother's grandmother never had diabetes. She was always eating lots of steamed vegetables. She wasn't frying anything. She was eating lots of fresh things. She was eating lots of nuts and seeds and using coconut. So now we all know. More pumpkin seeds, more nuts, more flax, more green leafy vegetables, more unsweetened cocoa powder. So uh, research shows that individuals who supplemented their diets with 1,000 milligrams of magnesium oxide, there are several different types of magnesium. There are lots of different types. So when you go visit your practitioner or your health food store, uh, ask them about the different types of magnesium. There's lots. Some magnesium also softens your stool. So if you take too much of it, it could give you diarrhea, but it depends on the type of magnesium you take. If you take high doses of magnesium biglycinate, you won't have that problem. If you take high doses of magnesium thrunate, which crosses the brain blood barrier, you won't have that problem. But if you take some other types of magnesiums, you might have that problem. So speak with your health practitioner or an expert at the health food store. But this, uh, this one study I found showed that individuals who supplemented their diet with 1,000 milligrams a day of magnesium oxide after only 30 days showed improved glycemic control. So that's something to investigate if you're having trouble balancing your blood sugar. So now I want to talk about artificials for a quick second. So there are a few different artificial sweeteners on the market. Uh, sucralose, Splenda, Aspartame, uh, ACE-K. What we're finding now is that as a society or a nation, we're not getting smaller. You would think that when we cut out sugar and we started using these artificial sweeteners that we would be losing weight, but it's the opposite. There's more obesity now. Obesity, if you're obese, that is uh, something that can lead to type 2 diabetes if you're overweight. So researchers are now are associating uh, consumption of diet soda with metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes. Everyone is drinking diet pop, or everyone thinks it's okay to drink diet pop because it will, you know, it's less sugar. You're going to lose weight. There's less calories, but the opposite is actually happening. There is an increased risk of metabolic syndrome and type two diabetes. Also, there is, there seems to be some kind of link between obesity and artificial sweeteners. So perhaps we need to put these artificial sweeteners away and start getting back to real sugar or real, not real sugar, or natural healthy alternatives. So there are also studies are showing that using these artificial, artificial sweeteners might raise our blood sugar by altering our gut bacteria. So it sort of does it in an indirect route. So we know when we eat white table sugar, which nobody in this room would ever do, but let's pretend we would eat white table sugar, it would, the glucose would get into our blood, we'd have high blood sugar instantly. When you have, when you down a packet of Splenda or some sort of artificial sweetener, it doesn't raise your blood sugar or have any caloric value to it, uh, per se, but it affects the bacteria in your gut, which in a roundabout way will then affect your blood sugar. So we don't want any artificial sweeteners. Then we have sugar alcohols. So there's xylitol and erythritol. Have you heard of these artificial, or have you heard of these sugar alcohols? Okay, so these are natural. Um, the, my only concern with these sugar alcohols, and there's no sugar involved and there's no alcohol involved, 
they tend to cause you some gastrointestinal discomfort. Yes, let's call it that. Um, has anyone had xylitol or erythritol before? Yes. Anybody notice any digestive issues by having it? Yes, I've had it. I remember there were these chips that came out like a long, 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 long time ago and it had some of these sugar alcohols on it. There was some digestive disruption. <laughs> so here are some healthy alternatives. Molasses, high in some minerals. Brown rice syrup, uh, coconut nectar, which I love. Coconut nectar, coconut sugar, lower on the glycemic index, but really is still a sugar. Then there's monk fruit, which is still pretty new. Has anyone heard of monk fruit before? Monk fruit looks white. Monk fruit is crazy expensive right now. Anything new is expensive. In a couple of years, it won't be as expensive. But monk fruit, natural, uh, low glycemic, uh, looks like white sugar, tastes like white sugar. And then there's stevia. Has anyone heard or used stevia before? Yes. So you can get stevia, you can get flavored stevia, or you can get plain stevia, and you can get them uh, dried or crystallized or as a liquid. Uh, here you go. Here's an example. So what makes stevia unique is that it's a zero calorie sweetener, uh, and it's natural. It's from it's a herbal. Uh, you can get it in a liquid, or you can get it in a powder. Uh, this brand is from Nature's Way. Uh, and you can get samples of the stevia upstairs at the Smith's Pharmacy booth. So you can use it in water or tea or coffee or in your baking. Um, and if you're baking, just be mindful if you're using the liquid versus using the powder because it could affect the properties of whatever you're making. And then I wanted to touch on omega-3s, which I love. I love talking about fat. Fat's my favorite topic. We, are we people with uh, blood sugar imbalances or type 2 diabetes, pre-diabetes, are deficient in omega-3 fatty acids. So is practically the rest of the world. The benefits of omega-3s, it helps stop blood clotting, it reduces pain. So studies show that if you take enough omega-3 or have enough omega-3s in your body, after a while, you won't need to take uh, NSAIDs or aspirin if you have to take that on a regular basis. It naturally helps you reduce pain, it improves brain function and reduces inflammation. So they're saying inflammation is the root of all disease. So making sure you have enough omega-3s in your body will reduce inflammation. On the opposite end are omega-6s. So they do the opposite. Omega-6s increase inflammation. Too much omega-6s, I should throw that in. Not omega-6s just flat out, but too much omega-6s in our body. Lower our brain function, depress the immune system, promote constriction of the arteries, and promote blood clotting. So here are some great sources of omega-3s, uh, flax seeds, which we talked about, chia seeds, which I sort of think of as flax seeds cousin. Uh, again, if you're vegetarian or vegan and you need to make an egg replacement using three tablespoons of water to one tablespoon of chia seeds will give you that consistency. Uh, or hemp seeds. Does anybody here use hemp seeds? Yes, hemp seeds are great, great source of omega-3. Uh, seaweed is great, winter squash is great, and again, look at those leafy greens, which are high in what? What, what minerals high in leafy greens? There's no prize, this is just a group. Magnesium, good, I don't want you to forget that. Magnesium is high in leafy greens. Keep eating those leafy greens. Here are some more examples of some omega-3 rich foods. Again, we talked about our flax seeds and our walnuts. Uh, if you eat fish, salmon and herring. Cold water fish, really, really high in omega-3s. Uh, flaxseed oil, which should always be kept cold. You never want to cook with flaxseed oil. Uh, if you're vegetarian, tofu or edamame. Cauliflower is also high in omega-3s with broccoli, kale, and cabbage. So here are some omega-6 sources. So here's an example where you're it, genetic or hereditary. When we were growing up, my mother would only cook with canola oil or vegetable oil, because I think I feel like that's all she knew. My grandmother, when she came to Canada, was, would only cook with that because that's what's on sale at the store and that's what you're going to buy because the things you used to use back home aren't readily available to you here. Back home, they use coconut oil. They came here, they use what's on sale. They're using uh, vegetable oil and canola oil and, and lots of it. So safflower oil, grapeseed oil, wheat germ oil, corn oil, walnut oil, soybean oil, all those oils listed there are high in omega-6s. When you have too many omega-6s in your body and you don't have enough omega-3s, you are promoting inflammation. 
So here's just a, a chart or a schematic that shows you diabetes and omega-3. If you have enough omega-3s in your body, it will decrease inflammation, decrease your triglycerides, decrease oxidative stress, decrease your blood pressure. It does all that good decreasing stuff. It will increase your ins insulin sensitivity, so your body's more sensitive to it, and increase the amount of insulin that your pancreas is squirting out. So there are tremendous benefits to omega-3s. So that we just saw a list of all of the great foods, vegetarian, uh, vegan, and uh, otherwise, where you can find your omega-3 sources, and you can also get it in a supplement. You can take omega-3s uh, omega in capsules or in liquid form. I'm gonna skip that study. But it, basically, there was a study, a finished study, that just showed uh, you reduce 33% if you incorporate omega-3s in your body. There was another study in 2011, this one's an American study. They followed over 3,000 older adults, so by older they mean anybody over 75, and they, they did a 10-year follow-up. So they found individuals with the highest concentrations of both types of FAs, FA is for fatty acids, had lower risk of diabetes. So people with the highest concentrations of uh, fatty acids had lower risk of diabetes. And then there was another study uh, in Singapore, so they followed over 43,000 Chinese men and women who didn't, free of chronic disease, they were perfectly fine, nothing was wrong with them, aged between 45 and 74. So their results, they found that when they increased their intakes of total omega-3 fatty acids, it was inversely, so opposite, associated with diabetes. So the more omega-3s they had, the less likely they had uh, with diabetes. So consumption of non-marine sources, uh, so non-fish sources of omega-3 fatty acids, is associated with a decreased risk of type 2 diabetes in Chinese and Chinese Singaporeans. This is over 43,000 people, so I think that's a really good, valid study. So basically, a couple of takeaway messages. I want you all to know you should, I'd like to encourage you to increase your consumption of omega-3s in your diet, whether it be from fish or flax sources, although studies show you get more from uh, a fish source. Um, you will decrease your risk of getting heart disease. This is from Penn State Nutritionist. And if you have a sweet tooth like I used to, I'm okay now, you wanna try stevia. So it's natural, it's herbal, it's uh, zero calories and doesn't impact your blood sugar. There's a naturopathic doctor in the States, his name is Dr. Michael Murray. He's also shown that the level of fatty acids in your red blood, red blood cells, you can go to your doctor and ask him, to do some, ask him or her to do something called an omega-3 index. That will measure the amount of fatty acids in your red blood, shell, red blood cells. So he's shown that it's been, um, it's been the most accurate predictor of uh, the risk of having heart disease or a stroke. He found that was a more sensitive indicator than testing your cholesterol, your LDL, HDL, or your CRP. That's another test you can ask your doctor to do. So if you're so inclined, the next time you're visiting your practitioner or your physician, you can ask for, uh, when you're getting your blood work done or your physical, you can ask them to do your omega-3 index. I'm not sure if you have to pay for that. I think, I think it may be included. Um, and your CRP. When you test your CRP levels, it shows the amount of inflammation you have in your body. And omega-3s are incredible at lowering your inflammation levels. So, uh, what I want to leave you with is uh, sort of what, what I call nutrition therapy. So I know we just talked about a whole bunch of herbs. We talked about chromium and and uh, gymnema and berberine, and we talked about omega-3s. By no means am I expecting you to go run out to the grocery store, the health food store, and like stock up on all these supplements. Everybody is unique. What works for you doesn't work for my mom. What works for you won't work for you. My basic philosophy is that it should be food first, because really food is what got us into that, uh, the state that we're in. Food first. So if you're not getting enough protein in your diet, you're not getting enough fat in your diet, you're not getting enough uh, low glycemic good carbs in your diet, or you're not getting enough fiber in your diet, those are like, that's the, like the foundation when I work with my clients on how to build their blood sugar levels. Sometimes you don't even need supplements. Sometimes literally it's just changing the way you eat. Um, and again, they say it's a combination of genetics, diet, exercise, and lifestyle. So by simply making small, small changes in your diet, if you, I met someone who used to drink uh, Tim Horton's um, quadruple, quadruple, quadruple. So that's a problem. If we, you know, wean them off 
get them to a triple triple, then get them to a double double, and eventually, you know, get them to drinking it black. Making little changes like that, switching out the white rice. If you're having sushi, switch from white rice to brown rice. If you're always eating, um, you know, putting lots of sugar in your oatmeal or your porridge, adding some stevia, or maybe put some applesauce in there, or sprinkling some blueberries in there, or, or you're drinking juice all the time, maybe drink some cold herbal tea, or drinking more water, adding some lemon slices to your water, adding some cinnamon to your water. Um, so when we try all of that, and then we try some exercising. So if you're a couch potato, we go for a walk, or we, we start to lift things. We get flex bands, we start to lift. You don't need to have a gym membership. You don't need any fancy equipment. Having a chair, doing squats, doing lunges, doing laundry, doing gardening can also help. So we try all of that, and then we fill in the gaps with supplements. We can add bilberry, which is a great antioxidant for your eyes. People with type 2 diabetes, they need to be very careful about their eye health, and using a great sub antioxidant supplement like bilberry helps. Fiber, if you're not getting enough fiber in your food, you can supplement with fiber. You can get psyllium, you can use more flax, you can use more chia. Using chromium or cinnamon. So again, we fill in the gaps, but we always start with food first. If you have any questions, I will be upstairs offering yummy samples of some omega-3s. So uh, Nutri-C has omega-3 fish oil and vegan oil. Uh, the vegan oil is citrus flavored, it's very yummy. They have a, an omega-3 fish oil that's chocolate flavored, that's very, very yummy. That goes great in a smoothie with that unsweetened cocoa powder, and some kale and some spinach and some flax and some chia and all that good stuff. And then there's also stevia. So upstairs, I think they're in booth 202, they are giving out samples of uh, stevia mixed with water so you can try it. Because typically, and I've, I've tried other stevia too, and some of it's not very delicious. You get this like weird aftertaste. What makes Nature's Way Stevia unique is that there's no alcohol involved and it's, uh, a nat it's naturally extracted. So you, you will find you may need to use more of their Stevia compared to another brand Stevia, but you won't get that weird aftertaste. And it's organic. So I would like to thank you for your time. If you guys have any questions, I don't know how I'm doing for time because I don't have a clock in front of me. Um, I guess until they kick me out, I'll stay here and hang out. But once they do kick me out, because they will, <laughs> I'll be upstairs at the Smith's Pharmacy booth. Thanks for your time and your attention. And for participating. Thank you. And thank you. <laughs> Who, anybody have a question? Yes. Is magnesium citrate enough magnesium? Magnesium citrate's good, but that may cause some loose stool. Uh, magnesium bisglycinate or biglycinate is good. That's a good one to look into. And the magnesium oxide. And you can get magnesium in capsules, you can get it in powder, you can get, in, get it in liquid. Whatever form works best for you is what you should take. But anything that's liquid or broken down already, you absorb faster. Young lady in the black hat, did you have a question? You took the alpha lipoic acid IV? Yes, oh, really? Yeah. That's great. I've never met anyone who's done it before. How are you feeling? Oh, not too bad. I, it, but I, I, just I can't answer that. Did you work with a naturopath? Yeah, really you went to the diabetes clinic and they gave you the alpha lipoic acid? Yeah, oh, okay, that's great. You would have to ask your naturopath. I've never given. Um, uh, my uh, alpha lipoic acid IV and don't know anything about it, uh, but that's great. Yes, we're done. Yes, we're finished. We we're just answering questions. That's me getting kicked out. Okay, thank you all. I'll be upstairs if you have any questions.